The one thing I can assure you is, is that the story that I'm going to tell you today um, is a kind of story you're not going to hear from any other speaker coming to this room at any other point. Um, let me start out by <coughs> telling you a little bit about myself. Um, uh, I was here at Stanford uh, 20 years ago. I'm actually back for my 20-year um, reunion, which is what brought me here today. And, and, uh, and so I thought maybe I would share with you a little bit of my own psychology when I was sitting in these um, seats um, uh, 20 years ago. Um, pro probably when, when you hear me speaking, uh, one of the questions that, that uh, would show up in your mind is, um, what is this guy with an American accent from Chicago doing, having been the, at one point the largest foreign portfolio investor in Russia, and um, what I will describe to you in a minute, now one of the biggest enemies of the state of Russia? And, um, and so uh, let me explain to you how that all happened. Um, uh, indeed, I am an American. I'm from Chicago. Um, but I come from a very unusual family. My grandfather, um, uh, who is also American, his name is Earl Browder, um, grew up in Wichita, Kansas. And um, the family lost its the, the, the home and the farm in the 1920s. And he um, had to work in a factory. And, um, uh, the factory was mistreating their workers, and so he became a labor union organizer. And he was very good at it. And so in, um, after working in Wichita, he was recruited by the union to work in Kansas City, then to work in New York City. And in New York City, there were various communists that were running around. And um, the communists spotted him and said, this is a talented guy. Let's invite him to Moscow. And so the Communist Party invited him to Moscow in 1927. He moved to Moscow there. Um, he uh, met my grandmother in Moscow, and um, my father was born there. And then in 1932, he was sent back by the Communist Party to America to become the general secretary and head of the Communist Party of, of America for the next 13 years. <laughs> this is my grandfather. So, <clears throat> um, the McCarthy era came in the 1950s, and I'm sure you all have, know about that. And so it wasn't such an easy time to, he got kicked out of the Communist Party, I should say, my grandfather in 1945 for, for uh, proposing that communism and capitalism could coexist. And, and unfortunately, um, many of his followers in Eastern Europe were um, assassinated. He was fortunate living in America that he wasn't. Um, and then he was persecuted by McCarthy and had a very terrible time even after being kicked out of the Communist Party in, in the 1950s. So this is my family. Um, Things normalized. I was born in 1964, so I'm 45 years old. Um, and I grew up in, this, in a university uh, community in the south side of Chicago. And I basically was just a regular American kid. Um, and when I became a teenager, um, uh, as often happens in American families, um, I decided to rebel against my family. But how do you rebel against a family of communists? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you how I rebelled. I put on a, a suit and tie and became a businessman. There was nothing I could do to piss off my parents more than that. <laughs> and I came to Stanford Business School. And so I sat in these rooms for two years, as many of you do and are, will be doing and um, have done. And, um, and I went to brown bag lunches and I went to recruiting events, trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And something, something didn't quite feel right, because even though I was rebelling against my family to become a businessman, I just didn't quite feel right. And so as I was searching my soul to say, what should I do with my life? I said, what, what's my unique comparative advantage um, uh, with all these other people that are also smart and also good and also ambitious? And I thought, well, I, I, um, I'm, a I'm a businessman, but I am also the grandson of the head of the Communist Party. Um, <laughs> That's my competitive advantage. And it, just so <laughs> and, it, and it just so happened that 1989 was the year that the Berlin Wall came down. And, um, and so I had a chance to do a business in the uh, former communist countries. And guess what? Not a single person I knew anywhere in the world had any interest in doing it. And so I showed up, and I started looking for jobs where I could be a, doing business in Eastern Europe. And everyone said, why would you want to do that? There's no business in Eastern Europe. And I looked for jobs and looked for jobs. And people offered me all sorts of mainstream, normal jobs that, that I wanted to do business in Eastern Europe. And eventually, I got a job at the Boston Consulting Group in London. And they had a, an eccentric partner there who said that, well, we don't have any business in Eastern Europe. But if we ever do, you can be our guy. You can be the head of our Eastern European practice. 
So I said, okay, that's as good as I'm going to get. So I went to London. I went to work at the Boston Consulting Group. And indeed, <coughs> a few months later, we got a, a first nibble of, of work in Eastern Europe. And the, um, the work we got was with a bus factory um, in Poland, on the, in the southeast corner of Poland, about six hours from Warsaw by car on the Ukrainian border. The bus factory was being uh, almost going out of business. They, I think their sales had declined by 90%. And somehow the um, World Bank got involved and said, we need a consultant out here. Um, and BCG put in a big proposal saying, we have experts in buses and we have experts in manufacturing. We have experts in all these different things. And the World Bank said, great, send them. And so they sent me as a first year associate fresh out of Stanford. <laughs> So I, I go to this um, failing bus factory, and it's pretty clear that there's no hope for this bus factory. If their sales are declined by 90%, they're just going to have to lay off 90% of their employees if they want to stay in business. And so it was not a very um, pleasurable assignment. But one thing happened to me while I was sitting in this little town six hours from Warsaw, um, and I noticed that in, in the newspaper, um, they, one day they had all these financial statements in the middle of the newspaper. And I asked my translator, I didn't speak a word of Polish, I said, what are these financial statements? And he said, oh, these are the first, th these are the first privatizations that the Polish government's doing. I said, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and, and I said, so let's, I said, what does this thing say? What does this thing say? So we started to like write down the numbers. And basically, they were selling seven Polish companies at valuations which were half of their one year previous earnings. Okay, now I, 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 I wasn't actually all that great a student at Stanford, but I, but I knew, but, but even, even not being a great student, I understood that if you buy a company at half of one year's earnings, um, that's got to make sense, right? I mean, <laughs> and so, and, and, and I didn't have a lot of money. I don't come from a wealthy family or anything, but I had saved up 4,000 bucks at that point. And I took my entire life savings, which is 4,000 bucks, I converted it into Polish Zloty. I took it down and I applied for shares in these first privatizations and I bought them. And they went up 10 times over the next 12 months. Now, if you've ever made 10 times your money on anything, you'll know that it releases a certain chemical in your body. <laughs> and, and, and you want that chemical released again. And so I knew I had found my vocation. I was going to go and buy it into privatizations in Eastern Europe. So we fast forward a couple years, and I end up at Solomon Brothers. <clears throat> and, I'm working, and, and I got a job at Solomon Brothers uh, as an investment banker. So I go to work at Solomon Brothers as an investment banker. And Solomon Brothers doesn't exist anymore. It became part of Citigroup, and Citigroup hardly exists or won't, won't exist or whatever. But, um, and, and I go to work at Solomon Brothers, and, and for those of you who have ever read Liar's Poker, um, it's a great, great book, and if you haven't, you should. And it talks about the, the incredible culture of Solomon Brothers, which is this dog-eat-dog -dog place. And I go to work at Solomon Brothers, and my, on my first day at Solomon Brothers, um, as an investment banker for Eastern Europe, they give me my business cards, they give me my desk, and they say, you basically have to earn five times what we're paying you, or otherwise you're going to get fired, or earn it for the firm. Get to work. So I... I um, there's no training program, there's no mentors, there's no uh, here's what you need to do. Get to work five times what we're paying you, otherwise you get fired. So I, I, I hear that there's a privatization of the Hungarian airline um, and uh, what, there's some team working on it. And so I, I, uh, I, I go to the um, uh, conference room where they're supposed to be having a team meeting um, and I walk in and they look at me and say, what are you doing here? I said, well, I, you know, I'm here to help. And they say, we don't need your help. Um, you know, this is well taken care of, please leave. Because they didn't want to share any of their five times with me because that was just going to make their life more difficult. So no, no hungry. I, I then heard about a, a Polish telecom privatization going on a couple days later. And so I go and try to wedge my way into that. And they say, don't even think about coming anywhere near Poland. <laughs> and I'm thinking, how am I going to ever survive in this firm? And they're extremely uncollegial. And it was, uh, how am I ever going to survive in this firm? And then I came up with this idea. At the time, this was 1992, um, there was no investment banking work in Russia. And so none of these guys were being, trying to protect their turf. And so I just declared myself the investment banker in charge of Russia because nobody, <laughs> no, nobody was, and there was nobody, and, and, and I declared it waiting for somebody to object, but nobody objected because there was no money, that, that there was just nothing going on. Then I had an interesting opportunity about three months into my 
investment banking leadership in Russia, um, <laughs> I got my first bite of a, of a, of a mandate. And it was a, a fishing fleet located in Murmansk, which was 300 miles north of the Arctic Circle. And this fishing fleet, it was called the Murmansk Trawler Fleet, um, had, had some kind of fishing dispute with somebody buying their fish. And they had hired Cleary Gottlieb to settle the dispute. And Cleary Gottlieb, a, the big New York law firm, had recommended that they hire an investment banker to advise them on privatization. And so I went to the library at Solomon Brothers and discovered that like 20 years before, Solomon Brothers had done some fishing deals in Japan. And I proudly put these into a, into a presentation to the Murmansk Trawler Fleet. And lo and behold, they called us up and said, you've won the, the uh, assignment. Please come and, and, uh, and negotiate fees. And uh, so I um, started getting in touch with them to, to negotiate fees. And, and, uh, uh, and it turned out that they were ready to pay $50,000 a month for two months to advise on their entire privatization. Now, um, uh, there's, not a, there's not an investment banker that would get out of bed for $50,000 um, for two months or for a month. But um, I, it was $50,000 greater than zero, which is what I had earned so far as the head of the Russian investment banking <laughs> business. And so I took the assignment. And I, and I uh, got on a plane to Murmansk. And I got, got to Murmansk, which is a very, very desolate, terrible place. Really just a horrible place. Um, <laughs> and I um, <clears throat> sat down with the head of the fishing fleet. And I um, asked him, uh, what's going on? How can I help? And, he's, and he, he walked me through the math. And they, they basically had 100 ships. Each ship cost $20 million new. So there's $2 billion worth of ships, maybe seven years old in total, so about half depreciated. So $1 billion worth of ships. And he had hired me to decide whether the management should exercise their right under the privatization program to purchase 51% of this fleet for $2.5 million. <laughs> so it was actually quite an easy assignment. You know? <laughs> and again, you didn't have to be a Stanford MBA to, to advise on this stuff. Um, Five million market cap, a billion dollars worth of ships. Uh, <laughs> so, but I, I, you know, I had that chemical reaction that I had from, from uh, Poland sort of pumping through my system at this point. And I thought to myself, I want to get involved in some of this, uh, th this stuff. And, uh, and so the first thing I did after leaving there was I, I um, instead of going back to London, I went to Moscow to see whether, whether this was just an anomaly in this fishing fleet or whether the whole situation was the same all over Russia. And it turned out that, that the entire Russia was being put through the same type of privatization program. And, and what I learned, I, I, I didn't know a soul in Moscow. I didn't speak a word of Russian. And I got hold of an English language yellow page directory that they had for English language business visitors. And I just started circling people in the yellow page directory and going around meeting them. And I met about 30 people. And I, over a course of a week, I put together the, the, uh, the, um, the, the sort of thought about what this is. And it was very simple, that um, they had vouchers um, uh, that they gave to every person in the country. And there's 150 million people in the country. And each voucher cost 20 bucks. And so um, that gave you $3 billion worth of vouchers. And that was exchangeable for 30% of all the share capital of all the shares in Russia, which meant the entire value of Russia in 1992 um, was $10 billion for the whole country. All the oil, all the gas, all the metals, all the everything, $10 billion. And boy, at this point, the, the adrenaline was just pumping through my system. And I, I, it was clear that this was just the most unbelievable, unbelievable opportunity ever. Um, so I go back to Solomon Brothers, where I had been working. And I say, listen, we're wasting our time with all this $50,000 advisory stuff. We should get in there, and buy some of this stuff, and we'll make a fortune. There's, there's giving it away, gold for free. And, and they looked at me like I was completely out of my mind. And, and I, I thought, how could I? And people said, what, Russia? Invest in Russia? What are you, crazy? And, um, and, the more pe and I didn't know how to work in organization or politics or anything. And so the more, the more, that they, the more people sort of blanked me. And, and didn't want to talk about it, the more I would just like try to find somebody else who would listen to me. And so I was just talking to more and more people, which was exactly the wrong thing to do in an organization where that, that, that starts going on. And so pretty soon, uh, we used to have these uh, group lunches among, with the young guys who all were in the same year. And like, people stopped inviting me to the group lunches. No more, uh, <laughs> no more drinks. You know, no, people didn't want to be seen with me. I was some kind of eccentric outcast. And I wasn't earning any money for the firm either. That five times thing was coming close to being due. So I, I, was, I was in this terrible situation of becoming like a, an outcast in the firm and very unpopular. And, and uh, my job was on the line. And I was feeling very bad about myself. 
And one day I got a call from a um, very senior person in the New York office who's responsible for the firm's balance sheet. And he said, I heard that you might have something interesting to say about Russia. Why don't you um, come and, and tell me about it? And so um, I, um, I, I prepare myself a, a PowerPoint presentation so hopefully I can somehow get through to this guy and maybe turn my situation around. So I go to New York and this guy is meeting with um, was a very, very strange fellow very, with no social graces whatsoever. And um, he was like one of their most successful investors in the firm, but n n nobody could ever work on his team for long because he just had no, he was just a, a, not, not, a, not a character to work with. And so I go and sit down with him and I, and I start taking him through my PowerPoint presentation showing these numbers that I've just shared with you. And, um, and he wasn't nodding or giving me any kind of feedback. He was just looking at it really blankly. And I was going through my PowerPoint page after page and no, f no feedback, no, no response, no nothing. And, I, I, um, and I'm starting to feel a little worried. And about halfway through my presentation, he just gets up and leaves the room without saying a word. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking to myself, um, this is not good. This is, this is probably my last chance of getting, uh, you know, do, doing this. <coughs> and I'm trying to think about what I'm going to say when he comes back to this to this room so I can somehow salvage it. And I'm getting more and more worked up trying to think out how can I, how, how can I pull this out because you know, this, is my, this is my whole dream. This is, this is, this is how it's going to work. And uh, he comes back and before I have a chance to open my mouth, he said, this is the most unbelievable story I've ever heard. I've just gone to the risk committee and I've gotten an allocation for you to invest $25 million. Stop all this nonsense you're doing with investment banking. We're going to invest in this stuff. This is amazing. All of a sudden, a big cloud and a big weight has been lifted off my shoulders. I, I go back to London and I start investing. I, I, I go to London, get, get my stuff organized. I then go to Moscow and we start investing this $25 million, which was an enormous amount of money for the Russian market back then. And we get the $25 million invested. And seven months later, now we're in the middle of 1994, <coughs> The Economist magazine writes an article which outlines the same economics I've just taken you through. And it's called Sale of the Century. And all of a sudden, about 30 people Rich guys, a few hedge funds wake up and say, God, we should be invested in this thing. <laughs> and so they start calling up brokers or whoever to try to get invested. And our $25 million portfolio in that seven month period, because of this Economist article, went up five times in seven months because, of the, because, of, because all of a sudden 30 people showed up to start buying this stuff. So I've gone from 25 to 125 million. And this was back in the days when 100 million was a lot of money. <laughs> And so all of a sudden, all the guys who, who weren't inviting me to lunch and weren't, in, uh, weren't hanging out with me anymore started coming around my desk saying, Bill, you know, how could we get involved in, uh, in this Russian stuff? And I, I'd like to buy some of this stuff in my personal account. And I, 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 literally every morning there was like four guys hanging around my desk before I arrived waiting to get some advice on how they could make some of this money in Russia. Um, but more importantly than that, the, 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 the senior salespeople who had like big hedge fund clients at Solomon Brothers, um, started coming around and saying, you know, we, Bill, would you be willing to come to New York and meet George Soros? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Could you meet John Templeton, Michael Steinhardt? So I, I was like in my late 20s and I was being invited to meet the most successful investors on, on earth to explain to them what I had done in Russia. So I, um, I go to these uh, meetings and I take them through my PowerPoint and every single one of them says at the end of the meeting, that's the most amazing thing I've ever heard. Um, can we give you some money to manage? And I said, well, we're not actually in the business of managing anyone's money. Let me go back and ask my uh, colleagues and see whether we can, uh, we can do this. So I get back and I uh, ask my boss in London if, if this is something that we can do for other people. He said, great idea, for sure. Let's form a task force to study it. <laughs> so, I, um, so he said, next Monday will be the first task force meeting. So I show up to the task force meeting. And it's like this room. There's like 50 people showed up for the first task force meeting. And there's, there's only like two people in the firm who knew anything about, uh, about Russia. And um, I look around the room and people start, and, and there was like directors and managing directors and senior managing directors. And all, you know, I was like some junior vice president. And I was looking around the room and, I, and all these guys were sort of arguing with each other about which part of the firm was going to get the credit for this and who's going to get the money. And, and I was looking around thinking to myself, I know that there's, there's one thing I know for sure, who's not going to get any money out of this thing? <laughs> <laughs> so 
and I got really angry, and I went back, and I was tossing and turning for a few days, and I just, I said, this is, I just can't do this. And so I sucked up my gut, and I went into the, to the head of the trading floor, and I said, I'm, I'm quitting. I'm going to set up my own fund to do this. I said, Bill, you're crazy. You have such a promising career. I said, I'm sorry. I'm setting up my own fund to do this. And I went, I left Solomon Brothers, and I set up my fund called the Hermitage Fund. And I went back to all of these um, famous guys who I met on Wall Street, and I said, would you be willing to invest with me in my Hermitage Fund? And um, one of the guys who I met was a, a very famous, um, now deceased man named Edmund Safra. He was the owner of Republic National Bank in New York. And in the world of private banking, his name was as good as it ever, his name was like a, he's a legend in private banking. You might not know about him now, but if you kn knew uh, the history of, of, of wealth and private banking, this man was just like gold. And Edmund Safra put up the first $25 million to be my anchor investor. We became joint venture partners. And he said, if you do a good job um, uh, with this $25 million, then I will introduce you to all the rich people in the world and we'll make you into a spectacular success. But you need to do a good job first. So I moved to Moscow from London in 1996 and um, started investing. And it was really a, a very um, interesting thing because um, in 1996, there was not a single um, Wall Street educated in principal investor who was actually sitting on the ground in Russia. There was a lot of Wall Street principal investors sitting on the ground in Wall Street and there was a lot of Wall Street educated brokers sitting on the ground in Moscow, but no investors. And it was very interesting because the brokers would all write research about things that they could make a lot of commissions buying and selling. Um, and they wouldn't write research about the things that made the most sense. And so basically you end up in a situation where anything, any stock that was researched by the, by the brokers would trade at 10 times the valuation of any stock in the same industry that wasn't researched by the brokers, and nobody had any confidence in buying the stuff that wasn't researched because they couldn't do any research. So again, this is not rocket science. This is just simple, simple stuff. I thought, well, here I am on the ground. I can do my own research. Why don't I go visit the company that trades at one-tenth the valuation of the other one where there's a research report? So I went and visited the oil company that traded at one-tenth the valuation of Luke Oil, and a couple of them that did. And I looked at them, and there was no difference between the ones that were one-tenth of valuation, except for the fact that there wasn't a Credit Suisse research report. So after going through these companies and realizing that they're exactly the same, they have the same surly management, the same rusting oil derricks, the same bad uh, tax inspectors, the same everything, one was 10 times cheaper than the other. And by the way, the one that was 10 times more expensive was still one-tenth the valuation of the Western oil companies. So these are trading at one one-hundredth the valuation of the Western oil companies. So, I decided I'm going to invest in the stuff that's unresearched because I can do my own research. So I did my own research, invested in them, and my fund went up in the first month of operations, it went up 35%. Not, not in a year, but in a month. So some of Edmund Safra's clients had heard about that he was into this hot new thing in Russia and wanted to get involved. And they called up Edmund and said, can we um, invest in your fund? He said, no, 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 we don't know this guy. He could be stupid, he could be a crook. We have no idea. I want to audit. I want to have like a year's track record, audits, everything, and then I'll let everybody in. But I don't want to put my name next to his until I know for sure that he's, he's a, a solid guy. The next month, we were up 40%. <laughs> and the guys who had called him said, Edmund, what are you trying to do? You're, that was 40% we would have made if we had invested. And, and, and people were getting angry with him. They said, listen, Edmund, we're going to take some of our money out of your bank if you're being so greedy and not letting us into this thing, just keeping it for yourself. And he couldn't have imagined that his business risk was not going to be me blowing up and me doing too well. And so all these people were going to threatening to leave his bank because I had done so well and he wouldn't let him in. And so he relented, opened up the fund for outside investors. And by the end of the first year, we had about $100 million under management. We were up like 150%. Um, the next year was even better. Um, we were up 200 and I think we were up 242% um, in, in 1997. Um, we were up 800% from when we launched 18 months earlier. My fund was over a billion dollars. Again, this is when a billion dollars really meant something. <laughs> and I was the largest investor by, by any stretch of the imagination in a small market. They were writing articles about how clever I was on the front page of the New York Times. My clients were inviting me to their yachts. <laughs> <laughs> I was in my early 30s. I thought, that, I thought I've just figured it all out. I, and I had no perspective. I, I mean, everything that I've just told you was like, you know, one of them by themselves might not have been a sell signal, but 
you know, a young guy in his 30s with the biggest fund in a market, up 800% in 18 months, clients and yachts, front page articles. That is a sell signal if there ever was one. <laughs> but I was too young and too inexperienced to understand that. In 1997, the, the um, uh, Asian currency started to devalue. Um, uh, Asian markets started to go down. The Russians, uh, the Russian bond, the Russian government had a huge debt burden. It was rolling on a three-month basis with hedge funds and, and rich guys, and um, they couldn't roll it over. Russia defaulted, devalued. The stock market went down 88 percent. My one billion went down to 100 million. <clears throat> there was no more yachts invitations after that. <laughs> but then I discovered something far more um, disturbing than losing 90 percent of your money which was that the, the, the companies that I invested in, which were basically oil and gas companies in Russia, were run by people who, you've now, um, who are now sort of properly immortalized, uh, uh, the Russian oligarchs. These, these a small group of about 22 guys basically owned a majority of all these companies. And they used to behave themselves a little bit when they thought they, had a, they, that they needed access to Western capital, when the Western capital markets were open. But after the Russian um, economy defaulted and devalued and everything went uh, to hell, um, there was no more Western investors in any case, and so they no longer had any need to um, behave themselves. And so in 1998 and 1999, the Russian oligarchs embarked on an orgy of stealing that's been unprecedented in the history of business. I mean, it's just remarkable. Every type of scam you could ever imagine they were trying to do, asset stripping, transfer pricing, dilution, embezzlement, you name it, they were doing it. And I was owning 1% or 2% of these companies and just watching all the money that the companies had just disappearing. And so I had to decide something. I either, either was going to stay there and just put up with all this stuff, or I was going to have to, um, uh, uh, I mean, well, I mean ba basically, there, there, was, there, was, there was really only two choices. You could either leave or you could fight. I mean, I, I, I could not just watch it happen. And so we decided to fight. And, um, and the most famous fight um, involved Gazprom. And uh, Gazprom is a company that no one had really heard of in the West um, until like 10 years ago. But, uh, and Gazprom, um, is, it's the biggest gas company in the world. It's about 10 times the size of Exxon in terms of um, uh, hydrocarbon reserves. And Gazprom, in 1999, was trading at a 99.7% discount to BP or Exxon per barrel of hydrocarbon reserves. Why, why was it at such a big discount? Because everybody thought that everything, that everything was being stolen out of Gazprom. So I looked at this thing and I said to myself, could they really be stealing everything out of Gazprom? That would be just the most remarkable thing, a company 10 times the size of Exxon, everything being stolen. So I got together with my um, team and I said, let's do a stealing analysis of Gazprom. And they looked at me, how do you do a stealing analysis? So, <laughs> So we, th we started thinking, well, how do you do a stealing analysis? And, and uh, as I said <laughs> in the introduction, um, they, don't, they didn't teach me this at Stanford Business School. Um, you couldn't go to the company and say, how much are you stealing? <laughs> um, because they wouldn't tell you. <laughs> they might do worse things. You couldn't go to the brokers because the brokers are so busy preening themselves in front of Gazprom to get co corporate finance work that the last thing they would do is tell anybody how much stealing was going on. Um, but I learned something as a consultant at the Boston Consulting Group, which is um, if you want to find out the answer to something which is not written down somewhere, you just go and interview people. That's what the consultants do for any of you who are thinking about consulting. And um, so I said, let's make a list of all the people who know about stealing and gas problem and just ask them to breakfast, lunch, dinner, tea, coffee, and see what we can learn from interviewing them. We didn't know whether anyone would accept our invitations or tell us anything, but why not try? So we set up about 40 of these meals, and most people accepted the invitation. Why not? And we discovered something very interesting, is that in the communist days, the richest person in Russia was maybe 10 times richer than the poorest person. But by 1999, the richest person in Russia was like 250,000 times richer than the poorest person. And that just poisoned the whole environment of the country. Everyone just hated everybody else and hated the rich people and hated the people that stole and so people were, in these meetings were spilling their guts out to us about all the different scams they knew about. We were filling up notebooks with all these different allegations of scams. 
was interesting, really interesting stuff that people were telling us, writing it all down. We filled up a whole notebook with these allegations. But how do you know any th this stuff is true? You know, a lot of sour grapes. Now, Russia has one other great um, interesting anomaly, which is it's got to be the most bureaucratic country in the world. Everything that ever happens in Russia gets filed and quadruplicated in four different ministries. And you go to the bathroom, you have to write down, and then some ministry like um, registers it. And so, and, and what's interesting is that you can just go and ask for the information. It's just a question of like going to the ministry. And so one of my guys, one of, uh, one of the guys who works for me, my head of research, started going around to different ministries, picking up databases on different things. And we were able to take these databases we got from the ministries and cross-reference them with all the stuff we learned in these breakfast, lunches, and dinners. And we learned exactly how much had been stolen from Gazprom by who, in what way. And basically what we learned um, was that nine individuals from management of Gazprom had stolen um, an oil company the size of Exxon out of Gazprom. That's pretty dramatic. I mean, well, it's, it's the size of Kuwait, the, the oil reserves the size of Kuwait had been stolen out of Gazprom. Um, but we also um, learned that um, uh, the oil company the size of, of Kuwait is, is only 9% of Gazprom's reserves. 91% was still there. So what do you do if the market's pricing something as if there's a 99.7% discount and um, you've just discovered uh, that really there should only be a 10% discount? You go and buy the hell out of the thing. And that's what we did. We made Gazprom our single largest investment. That's usually where a fund manager would stop. But we said to ourselves, this is just so morally outrageous what these guys have done and it's so obvious. Let's share this information with the world. <laughs> and so we did. Um, we, we broke it into seven chapters. I gave a chapter to the Financial Times, a chapter to the Wall Street Journal, a chapter to the New York Times, Business Week. And each of them wrote a story. And boy, did that set the M Moscow <coughs> night on fire. <laughs> There were parliamentary hearings, there were, there were shareholder votes, there was articles, more articles, more hearings, investigations. And about seven months later, uh, Putin, who had become president in, in uh, 1999, stepped in, fired the, the um, head of Gazprom, um, put a new guy in who said his responsibility was to, to recover the lost assets and not let any more Gazprom assets leave the company. And from the moment that we started this thing until 2005, the, sh the stock price was up 100 times. <laughs> we got so excited by this that we started doing it elsewhere. We did it at the Unified Energy Systems, the National Electricity Company. Uh, we did it at Spear Bank, the National Savings Bank. Um, we did it at um, Surgo Neftegas. And it was working like a charm. Not everything was as, as, as remarkable as Gazprom, but it was all pretty, pretty amazing. Um, the fund went up something like 40 times from, from uh, uh, we went from 100 million to more than uh, 4 billion. I became the largest investor in Russia. Um, it was just amazing. Um, and now I'm gonna show you a, um, a video for, for the last um, 10 minutes of what happened next because the video is better than I could ever, I could ever um, do it. It's the true Kafka-esque type of situation. It's black as white, white as black. Um, it's the most unbelievable thing you could ever imagine. It's one thing to be victimized of a crime. It's another thing to then be blamed for the crime that you're a victim of. The following is a story so extraordinary you couldn't make it up. A story about the risks of investing in Russia today. A story about how companies are stolen, criminals take over banks, and murderers dictate to judges. About how politicians pay lip service to cleaning up the system, but in fact do nothing or actively assist the criminals. It's a story whose twists and turns lead down a dark trail of corruption, violence, and the theft of $230 million from the Russian people. Crimes like the one we're about to describe happen in Russia every day. And this is how it can happen. Uh, 
Hermitage Capital Management um, is an investment firm that started in 1996 to focus on the Russian equity market. And I founded it in partnership with the late Edmund Safra. And we were the largest foreign portfolio investor in Russia. Everything had been going beautifully with the business. We had been growing the fund. We had been making money for our investors. We had been stamping out corruption in the companies we invested in. But as often happens when you step on enough toes, eventually people, certain people, get angry with you. On November the 13th, 2005, when he was returning home to Moscow from a business trip, Bill Browder was refused entry at the airport. Later, he was told by the Russian authorities that he'd been banned from the country on the grounds of national security. I then tried using every friend and contact I have to get back into Russia. I had an interesting opportunity. I was attending the World Economic Forum in Davos in January 2007. And Dmitry Medvedev, who is now the president, who was then the uh, first deputy prime minister, was making his official foreign debut. And at the forum, I had an opportunity to have a brief conversation with him where I asked him for help in restoring my visa. And he was responsive. He said he would help. He asked for a copy of my visa application. I thought with the um, help of the first deputy prime minister, my visa would be approved in no time at all. What happened next was very different from what Bill had expected. Enter Lieutenant Colonel Artem Kuznetsov of the Tax Crimes Unit at the Moscow Ministry of the Interior, who a few weeks after Bill Browder's appeal to the first Deputy Prime Minister Medvedev to reissue his entry visa, telephoned Hermitage. Lieutenant Colonel Artem Kuznetsov called up my head of research, and he said to him, I understand that the CEO of your company wishes to get a visa to visit our country, and I'm responsible for writing the report. Before I write the report, I'd like to have an informal meeting, show you a few papers, ask a few questions. Depending on how you behave and what you provide in this meeting will be the determining factor in whether the visa gets issued or not. Hermitage rejected this extortion attempt and refused to meet or talk with Kuznetsov. But Kuznetsov had his own plans. On June the 4th, 2007, Lieutenant Colonel Kuznetsov led a team of 25 officers in a raid on the Hermitage Moscow offices, taking servers, computers, and documents. The official reason he gave for this raid was that one of the Hermitage companies, Khmer, had supposedly underpaid dividend withholding tax. This was not true. Not only had Kamea paid up its tax, but the Russian tax authorities certified in writing that it had overpaid them by as much as four million rubles. In addition to Kuznetsov raiding our offices, he then um, joined an ongoing raid on the same day at the offices of our law firm, Firestone Duncan. One of their young lawyers protested. Instead of trying to explain whatever their legal logic was, they took him into a conference room, beat him viciously, arrested him for resisting the search. He was fined 15,000 rubles to get out of jail, and then he was in hospital for two weeks, having to recover from his beating. In fact, Kuznetsov's raids were the first part of the criminal's plan, a fishing expedition to find out the amount of Hermitage's assets and in which banks they were held. At the same time, Kuznetsov seized all of Hermitage's corporate documents and certificates. These official documents would be used by the criminals to steal the Hermitage companies. What happened next occurred without Hermitage knowing. The criminals went to the Russian courts in Kazan, St. Petersburg and Moscow and obtained judgments against the Hermitage companies on the basis of forged contracts. They even used real lawyers armed with bogus powers of attorney to represent the Hermitage companies. Instead of defending the Hermitage companies, the lawyers pleaded guilty. Logos Plus and two other companies belonging to the criminals were fraudulently awarded hundreds of millions of dollars by the courts. Later, Hermitage discovered that the three individuals who had been installed as the new directors of the stolen companies were criminals. Viktor Markelov, a convicted murderer, Valery Kurochkin, a convicted thief, and Vyacheslav Klebnikov, a convicted burglar. All three had been released from jail early by the Russian authorities. In total, three companies were stolen from the Hermitage Fund. According to the sham court judgments, together, the companies allegedly owed nearly $1.3 billion 
to the criminals' companies. The criminals could not have stolen the Hermitage companies or secured the judgments against them without the corporate documents and certificates seized by Kuznetsov in his raid of June the 4th and supposedly kept in his safe custody since then. Armed with the sham judgments, the criminals sent Kuznetsov to the banks to seize the assets. The one thing that this group of criminals hadn't bargained on was that there would be no assets there. So they put millions of dollars into this scam, bribing different officials, bribing judges, getting all sorts of people involved in this thing, and they got nothing. And so for a brief period of time, we felt very relieved and happy that they got nothing, and that was the end of the story. But it wasn't. Phase two of the criminal's fraud was to steal the $230 million of tax money already paid by Hermitage to the Russian authorities by claiming a tax rebate. This they did through the brilliant ruse of demonstrating that the $1.3 billion of alleged debt, which resulted from the sham court judgments, had wiped out Hermitage's profits in 2006. Within a mere three days of submitting the claim on the 24th of December 2007, Olga Tzime and Sergei Zemkuznikov, officials of the Russian tax office, authorized a staggeringly huge tax repayment of $230 million to the criminals. The largest single tax repayment in Russian history was made without a single question being asked. $230 million, which belonged to the Russian people, had been stolen by the criminals in an organized conspiracy supported by corrupt officials in the higher reaches of the Russian state. The Russian tax authorities paid the money into the criminals' accounts at two obscure banks, Universal Savings and Intercommerce. They covered their tracks, they laundered the money, and filed to liquidate the stolen Hermitage companies. Hermitage filed dozens of complaints at every level of the Russian state. Not a single institution or person on the special anti-corruption committee set up by President Medvedev has looked into the fraud against Hermitage. The most absurd part of the whole thing is, um, is that the only, the only complaint that got any traction was one which we sent to the Russian State Investigative Committee. Um, and, and what traction did that get? They blamed us for the tax crime. Meanwhile, for Bill Browder, matters took a further turn for the worse. Bill Browder has been put on the federal search list for standing up to corruption and organized crime. You can't steal $230 million from the Russian budget without having very, very senior officials involved. Clearly, we can see the names of the senior law enforcement officials going right up the chain. We can also see the involvement of senior tax officials, senior judges, lawyers. And then on top of that, you have all the people that we wrote to that decided to do nothing about it. And that tells you something. As this video is being produced, the Russian Ministry of the Interior Police have arrested Sergei Magnitsky, a lawyer and accountant working on hermitage affairs at the Moscow-based law firm Firestone Duncan. Six other Russian lawyers working for hermitage who have been trying to seek justice by reporting the $230 million tax fraud to the Russian authorities have either fled Russia or have gone into hiding. So a story is so extraordinary you couldn't make it up. A story about the risks of investing in Russia today. A story that sounds like a thriller but isn't. It's a true story and it's one that's being repeated every day.